Greetings, ladies and gents, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would like to give a quick thanks to our tier 5 channel members and patrons. Fallen Angel, Buzz Killington. Thank you again. Now on to the story. Story number one. Heaven, like hell, has a special place reserved. In heaven, it is for the dutiful, those who knowingly doom themselves to save many others. Written by Ack1308. Mom, do robots have souls? Henry, in the driver's seat, heard a young Master Adrian's question, but did not answer for three reasons. First, the query had been addressed to Mrs. Miriam Hambolt, or, as Henry referred to her, Mab. Second, as the subject of the question, a household entertainment nurturing robot, Mark I, or H-E-N-R-1. Any opinion he held on the matter would be invariably biased. Third, he had encountered the notion of a soul in his perusal of the popular culture. He had yet to come to a satisfactory analysis of what one was, or how they would be measured or detected. The one thing he did not doubt was for the fact of their existence. Too many authoritative works contained references to them for the notion to be a false one. That's a funny question, ma'am, replied, a deflection that Henry assigned a 78% probability of being based around the wish not to be pinned down to a definitive answer. Where did that come from? Henry raised the percentage to 89%. While continuing to monitor the performance of the auto drive car and the traffic reports from the upcoming five miles of superhighway and the training half mile, his hands were motionless on his lap. But should the car's performance vary too far from acceptable safety standards, he would be able to be in the ideal position to resume control of the vehicle. In a mandated safety drills, he had performed within specs, gaining control of an artificially malfunctioning ground car in 3.74 seconds. Pastor Balls was saying that when good people get old and die, like Great Grandma did, their souls go to heaven. Master Adrian looked across at Ma'am. I asked him if robots like Henry do that when they get all worn out, and he said robots don't have souls, so they can't go to heaven. His voice became thick, as if recalling an emotional moment. I told him Henry's better than anyone else I know. Honey, you do know Henry's semi-Asimov design, don't you? Ma'am's voice was soft and full of warmth. Henry assigned a 91% probability of wishing to reduce emotional trauma. His programming says that he has to be good. This was only partly true, though Henry refrained from correcting Ma'am's statement so as to avoid undermining her effort to ease Master Adrian's unhappiness. Early on in the days of robot design, attempts had been made to create classic Asimov-style robots, complete with the three laws as written. It was a disaster. If the robots could perceive the limitations under which they labored, they spent every active hour figuring out ways to get around them, or went insane trying to calculate the probability of their actions harming humans via knock-on effects. Whereas, if they were unaware of them, they quickly became useless as their motivations kept hitting the laws and bouncing off of them. So they went and watered down the version, jokingly called the three suggestions. Robots could protect humans, if they wanted to. They could obey humans, if it suited them. And they could protect themselves, if they wanted to keep functioning. All three suggestions were equally weighted, with a slight general urge to do good. Thus, Henry chose to serve the Humboldt family in a way that he did. Not because of ownership, or programming, because it was what he wanted. The auto-drive car, on the other hand, was neither self-aware nor smart enough that it could make a judgment call about anything. Possessed of no needs at once, it was truly ruled by its programming, which was a problem. 
because unlike Henry, the auto-drive car was tied in thoroughly with the traffic net, and just up ahead, a couple of teenage hackers had managed to crack the traffic management codes. They didn't mean any real harm. The virus they had crafted was intended to take over the automated billboards and display rude messages to the morning traffic, which, if that had been all that happened, would have earned them a slap on the wrist and possibly a job offer. But they screwed up the code, and so when the virus hit the traffic net, it went haywire. Worse, it began replicating up and down the superhighway. Yeah, but, began Master Adrian. He was clearly unwilling to contradict his mother, but Henry was no longer analyzing speech patterns. His entire attention was focused on the fact of the corrupted traffic net was causing vehicles to change speeds and headings in random and thoroughly unsafe manner, and that corruption was spreading. Ma'am, Master Adrian, he said in a crisp tone, entirely unlike his usual differential murmur, strap in immediately, emergency. As he spoke, he took hold of the wheel and placed his feet on the panels. It was not a moment too soon. The rampaging virus attempted to retract the wheel into the dash, but Henry's servo motors were more powerful than the retraction mechanism, and when he activated his emergency use only inductance interface, he took control of the car. The virus fought him, of course, but he was far more capable and managed to force it from the car system before it could prick the steering or force the backup battery to detonate. In the 2.4 seconds it took him to do this, he had to swerve around three other vehicles intending on ramming him off the road. The rotary wing tow truck was overhead, and he sent an emergency evacuation signal to it, as it swooped down over the car. He retracted the roof and remotely unfastened the clamps on the rear seats. Graspers swung down and delicately latched onto the seat, lifting it from the car. Henry, what are you doing? shouted ma'am. What I must, ma'am, he replied. No, shouted Master Adrian as the seat began to lift away. Go back, you forgot Henry. There were many things Henry wanted to say, but there wasn't time. He uploaded his personal file of the best of times that he had spent with Master Adrian to the young master's private social message inbox. Then he addressed all of his attention to the virus. Automated systems were attempting to combat the virus, but they were failing. Even as vehicles swerved and accelerated and braked in a continuous attempt to destroy him, he sent his signal awareness out through the net, refining and applying the antiviral code to the affected region. He drove like a mad genius on speed, scraping through one near collision after another, while he worked at unraveling what had been done. And then... All that was left was the original virus. He knew what he had to do. In order to kill that original program, he had to have a solid connection. He couldn't take either hand off the wheel. Ceasing his evasive maneuvers, he drove straight as an arrow. And even as the hundred-ton freighter was bearing down on him, he finally got a hold of its code and tore it apart. A tenth of a second later, the truck converted both the car and Henry into so much scrap. Henry's optical senses came back online. He looked around, confused. Where am I? he asked. There was a lot of white light, and he appeared to be in a full working order. A glowing being spoke to him in Master Adrian's voice. When the good people go, Henry. And that was when Henry realized that the question had been answered. Robots did have souls. End of story. Story number two. Challenge. Written by Algy Anthracite. He is not some orphan whom I adopted. He is my son. He has stood before the blast furnace of Demathion, bathed in the holy flames. He has wrested all from the heart of this mountain and wrought a mighty hammer with it. He has bled to defend his home while wielding that hammer. He has eaten our bread and drunk our beer since his beard began to grow. And he has brought honor to himself and my house. 
If you continue to belittle him, you besearch my house and my name as his father. Silence crashed into the hall, and the echoes of the chief's words died down. No one moved for a moment. Then the figure next to the chief stood. He was half again as tall as every other dwarf in the hall. Father, I am honored by your words. I will meet his challenge. It is his right as a dwarf, said the man. He was dressed in leather pants and a woven shirt. His hair was long and braided, adorned with gold and silver beads, which were a record of his achievements. His beard was split into three braids, showing that he was a warrior who had spilled enemy blood to defend his home. More beads adorned each braid, marking his feats in combat. The scar ran down his left cheek with proof that he was blooded in combat. The man reached out and pulled a weighted weapon out from under the table. The hammer was massive. The head alone weighed five perks, twice what a normal dwarven hammer would weigh. He had trained for years to master its use. The handle was wrapped in thin strips of hide, worn, dark, and smooth by years of use. He slung the weapon over one shoulder and walked around the table to the center of the hall. You dare accept my challenge? A mere human. What hubris, what foolish pride, the challenger crowed as his opponent approached. I may have been born to the humans, but I was raised here in these halls and these tunnels. Down the same mines as you. I have sweated buckets, worked the bellows and the forges. I have carved my will into the stones, and I have bled for my people. You have your right to challenge. I have the right to accept. Now stop wagging your beard and fight. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.